The Story of Civilization, Volume 6, The Reformation, by Will Durant. Part 3, Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. Scholars and historians were as numerous as poets. Always they wrote in Arabic, the Esperanto of Islam, and in many cases they combined study and writing with political activity and administration. Abu Fida of Damascus took part in a dozen military campaigns, served al-Nasir as minister at Cairo, returned to Syria as governor of Hama, collected an extensive library, and wrote some books that in their day stood at the head of their class. His treatise on geography, Taqwin al-Buldan, outranged in scope any European work of the kind and time. It calculated that three-quarters of the globe were covered with water, and noted that a traveler gained or lost a day in going westward or eastward around the world. His famous abridgment of the history of the human race was the chief Moslem history known to the West. But the great name in the historiography of the 14th century is Abdel Rahman ibn Khaldun. Here is a man of substance, even to Western eyes, solid with experience, travel, and practical statesmanship, yet familiar with the art and literature, science and philosophy of his age, and embracing almost every Moslem phase of it in a universal history. That such a man was born in Tunis in 1332 and raised there suggests that the culture of North Africa was no mere echo of Asiatic Islam, but had a character and vitality of its own. From my childhood, says Ibn Khaldun's autobiography, I showed myself avid of knowledge and devoted myself with great zeal to schools and their courses of instruction. The Black Death took his parents and many teachers, but he continued his studies until I found at last that I knew something, a characteristic delusion of youth. At twenty he was secretary to the Sultan at Tunis, at twenty-four to the Sultan at Fez, at twenty-five he was in jail. He moved to Granada and was sent as its ambassador to Peter the Cruel at Seville. Returning to Africa, he became chief minister to Prince Abu Abdallah at Bougie, but he had to flee for his life when his master was deposed and slain. In 1370, he was sent by the city of Tlemcen as envoy to Granada. He was arrested on the way by a Moorish prince, served him four years, and then retired to a castle near Oran. There, in 1377, he wrote the Mukadama al-Alamat, literally, Introduction to the Universe. Needing more books than Oran could supply, he returned to Tunis, but he made influential enemies there and removed to Cairo in 1384. His fame as a scholar was already international. When he lectured in the mosque of El Azhar, students crowded around him, and Sultan Barkouk gave him a pension, as was his wont with savants. He was appointed Kadi Malakite, or royal judge, took the laws too seriously, closed the cabarets, was lampooned out of office, again retired to private life. Restored as chief Qadi, he accompanied Sultan Nasir ad-Din Faraj in a campaign against Timur. The Egyptian forces were defeated. Ibn Khaldun sought refuge in Damascus. Timur besieged it. The historian, now an old man, led a delegation to ask lenient terms of the invincible Tatar. Like any author, he brought a manuscript of his history with him. He read to Timur the section on Timur and invited corrections. Perhaps he had revised the pages ad hoc. The plan worked. Timur freed him. Soon he was once more chief judge at Cairo, and he died in office at the age of 74 in 1406. Amid this hectic career, he composed an epitome of Averroes's philosophy, treatises on logic and mathematics, the Mukadama, a history of the Berbers, and the peoples of the East. Only the last three survive. Together they constitute the universal history. The Mukadama or Prolegomena, is one of the highlights in Islamic literature and in the philosophy of history, an amazingly modern product for a medieval mind. Ibn Khaldun conceives history as an important branch of philosophy and takes a broad view of the historian's task. History has for its true object to make us understand the social state of man, that is, his civilization, to reveal to us the phenomena that naturally accompany primitive life, and then the refinement of manners, the diverse superiorities that peoples acquire, and which beget empires and dynasties, the diverse occupations, professions, sciences, and arts, 
and lastly, all the changes that the nature of things can affect in the nature of society. Believing himself the first to write history in this fashion, he asks pardon for inevitable errors. I confess that of all men I am the least able to traverse so vast a field. I pray that men of ability and learning will examine my work with good will, and when they find faults will indulgently correct them. That which I offer to the public will have little value in the eyes of scholars, but one should always be able to count on the courtesy of his colleagues. He hopes that his work will help in the dark days that he foresees. When the world experiences a complete overturn, it seems to change its nature in order to permit new creation and a new organization. Hence there is need today of an historian who can describe the state of the world, of its countries and peoples, and indicate the changes in customs and beliefs. He devotes some proud pages to pointing out the errors of some historians. They lost themselves, he feels, in the mere chronicling of events, and rarely rose to the elucidation of causes and effects. They accepted fable almost as readily as fact, gave exaggerated statistics, and explained too many things by supernatural agency. As for himself, he proposes to rely entirely on natural factors in explaining events. He will judge the statements of historians by the present experience of mankind, and will reject any alleged occurrence that would now be accounted impossible. Experience must judge tradition. His own method in the Mukadama is first to deal with the philosophy of history, then with professions, occupations, and crafts, then with the history of science and art. In succeeding volumes he gives the political history of the various nations, taking them one by one, deliberately sacrificing the unity of time to that of place. The true subject of history, says Ibn Khaldun, is civilization, how it arises, how it is maintained, how it develops letters, sciences, and arts, and why it decays. Empires, like individuals, have a life and trajectory which are their own. They grow, they mature, they decline. What are the causes of this sequence? The basic conditions of the sequence are geographical. Climate exercises a general but basic influence. The cold north eventually produces, even in peoples of southern origin, a white skin, light hair, blue eyes, and a serious disposition. The tropics produce in time a dark skin, black hair, dilatation of the animal spirits, lightness of mind, gaiety, quick transports of pleasure, leading to song and dance. Food affects character. A heavy diet of meats, condiments, and grains begets heaviness of body and mind, and quick succumbing to famine or infection. A light diet, such as desert peoples eat, makes for agile and healthy bodies, clearness of mind, and resistance to disease. There is no inherent inequality of potential ability among the peoples of the earth. Their advancement or retardation is determined by geographical conditions and can be altered by a change in those conditions or by migration to a different habitat. Economic conditions are only less powerful than the geographical. Ibn Khaldun divides all societies into nomad or sedentary according to their means of getting food and ascribes most wars to the desire for a better food supply. Nomad tribes sooner or later conquer settled communities because nomads are compelled by the conditions of their life to maintain the martial qualities of courage, endurance, and solidarity. Nomads may destroy a civilization, but they never make one. They are absorbed in blood and culture by the conquered, and the nomad Arabs are no exception. Since a people is never long content with its food supply, war is natural. It is war that generates and renews political authority. Hence, monarchy is the usual form of government and has prevailed through nearly all history. The fiscal policy of a government may make or break a society. Excessive taxation or the entry of a government into production and distribution can stifle incentive, enterprise, and competition and kill the goose that lays the revenues. On the other hand, an excessive concentration of wealth may tear a society to pieces by promoting revolution. There are moral forces in history. Empires are sustained by the solidarity of the people, and this can be best secured through the inculcation and practice of the same religion. Ibn Khaldun agrees with the popes, the Inquisition, and the Protestant reformers on the value of unanimity in faith. To conquer, one must rely upon the allegiance of a group animated with one corporate spirit and end. Such a union of hearts and wills can operate only through divine power and religious support. 
When men give their hearts and passions to a desire for worldly goods, they become jealous of one another and fall into discord. If, however, they reject the world and its vanities for the love of God, jealousies disappear, discord is stilled, men help one another devotedly, their union makes them stronger, the good cause makes rapid progress, and culminates in the formation of a great and powerful empire. Religion is not only an aid in war, it is likewise a boon to order in a society and to peace of mind in the individual. These can be secured only by a religious faith adopted without questioning. The philosophers concoct a hundred systems, but none has found a substitute for religion as a guide and inspiration for human life. Since men can never understand the world, it is better to accept the faith transmitted by an inspired legislator who knows better than we do what is better for us and has prescribed for us what we should believe and do. After this orthodox prelude, our philosopher historian proceeds to a naturalistic interpretation of history. Every empire passes through successive phases. One, a victorious nomad tribe settles down to enjoy its conquest of a terrain or state. The least civilized peoples make the most extensive conquests. Two, as social relations become more complex, a more concentrated authority is required for the maintenance of order. The tribal chieftain becomes king. Three, in this settled order, wealth grows, cities multiply, education and literature develop, the arts find patrons, science and philosophy lift their heads. Advanced urbanization and comfortable wealth mark the beginning of decay. 4. The enriched society comes to prefer pleasure, luxury, and ease to enterprise, risk, or war. Religion loses its hold on human imagination or belief. Morals deteriorate, pederasty grows. The martial virtues and pursuits decline. Mercenaries are hired to defend the society. These lack the ardor of patriotism or religious faith. The poorly defended wealth invites attack by the hungry, seething millions beyond the frontiers. 5. External attack or internal intrigue, or both together, overthrow the state. Such was the cycle of Rome, of the Almoravids and Almohads in Spain, of Islam in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Persia. And it is always so. These are a few of the thousands of ideas that make the Mukadama the most remarkable philosophical product of its century. Ibn Khaldun has his own notions on almost everything but theology, where he thinks it unwise to be original. While writing a major work of philosophy, he pronounces philosophy dangerous and advises his readers to let it alone. Probably he meant metaphysics and theology rather than philosophy in its wider sense as an attempt to see human affairs in a large perspective. At times, he talks like the simplest old woman in the marketplace. He accepts miracles, magic, the evil eye, the occult properties of the alphabet, divination through dreams, entrails, or the flight of birds. Yet he admires science, admits the superiority of the Greeks to the Moslems in that field, and mourns the decline of scientific studies in Islam. He rejects alchemy, but acknowledges some faith in astrology. Certain other discounts must be made. Though Ibn Khaldun is as broad as Islam, he shares many of its limitations. In the three volumes of the Mukadama, he finds room for but seven pages on Christianity. He makes only casual mention of Greece, Rome, and medieval Europe. When he has written the history of North Africa, Moslem Egypt, and the Near and Middle East, he believes that he has narrated the history of all peoples. Sometimes he is culpably ignorant. He thinks Aristotle taught from a porch and Socrates from a tub. His actual writing of history falls far short of his theoretical introduction. The volumes on the Berbers and the Orient are a dreary record of dynastic genealogies, palace intrigues, and petty wars. Apparently he intended these volumes to be political history only, and offered the Mukadama as a history, though it is rather a general consideration, of culture. To recover our respect for Ibn Khaldun, we need only ask what Christian work of philosophy in the 14th century can stand beside the prolegomena. Perhaps some ancient authors had covered part of the ground that he charted, and among his own people, Al-Masudi, who died in 956, in a work now lost, had discussed the influence of religion, economics, morals, and environment on the character and laws of a people, and the causes of political decline. Ibn Khaldun, however, felt 
and with some reason that he had created the science of sociology. Nowhere in literature before the 18th century can we find a philosophy of history or a system of sociology comparable in power, scope, and keen analysis with Ibn Khaldun's. Our leading contemporary philosopher of history has judged the Mukadama to be undoubtedly the greatest work of its kind that has ever yet been created by any mind in any time or place. Herbert Spencer's Principles of Sociology, 1876 to 1896, may compare favorably with it, but Spencer had many aids. In any case, we may agree with the distinguished historian of science that the most important historical work of the Middle Ages was the Mukadama of Ibn Khaldun. Chapter 31. Suleiman the Magnificent, 1520-1566. 1. African Islam, 1200-1566. It is hard for us, pigeonholed in Christendom, to realize that from the 8th to the 13th century Islam was culturally, politically, and militarily superior to Europe. Even in its decline in the 16th century it prevailed from Delhi and beyond to Casablanca, from Adrianople to Aden, from Tunis to Timbuktu. Visiting the Sudan in 1353, Ibn Battuta found there a creditable civilization under Muslim leadership, and a Negro Mohammedan, Abder Rahman Sadi would later write a revealing and intelligent history, Tariqa Sudan, circa 1650, describing private libraries of 1,600 volumes in Timbuktu and massive mosques whose ruins attest a departed glory. The Marini dynasty, from 1195 to 1270, made Morocco independent and developed Fez and Marrakesh into major cities, each with august gateways, imposing mosques, learned libraries, colleges squatting amid shady colonnades, and wordy bazaars where one could buy anything at half the price. In the 13th century, Fez had some 125,000 inhabitants, probably more than any city in Europe except Constantinople, Rome, and Paris. In its Karoine Mosque, seat of Morocco's oldest university, Religion and science lived in Concord, taking eager students from all African Islam and, in arduous courses of three to twelve years, training teachers, lawyers, theologians, and statesmen. Emir Yaqub II, who reigned from 1269 to 1286, ruling Morocco from Fez or Marrakesh, was one of the most enlightened princes of a progressive century, a just governor, a wise philanthropist, tempering theology with philosophy, shunning bigotry, and encouraging friendly intercourse with the Europeans. The two cities received many refugees from Spain, and these brought a new stimulus to science, art, and industry. Ibn Battuta, who had seen nearly all of vast Islam, called Morocco the earthly paradise. On the way from Fez to Iran, the modern traveler is surprised to find at Tlemcen the modest remnant of what in the 13th century was a city of 125,000 souls. Three of its once sixty-four mosques, the Jama el kabir from 1136, the Mosque of Abul Hassan from 1298, and that of El Halawi from 1353, are among the finest in the Mohammedan world. Marble columns, complex mosaics, brilliant mirabs, arcaded courts, carved wood, and towering minarets survive to tell of a splendor gone and almost forgotten. Here the Abdel Wahid dynasty, 1248 to 1337 and 1359 to 1553, maintained for three centuries a relatively enlightened rule, protecting Christians and Jews in religious freedom and providing patronage to letters and arts. After the Turks captured the city in 1553, it lost its importance as a center of trade and declined into the shadows of history. Farther east, Algiers flourished through a mixture of commerce and piracy. Half hidden in a rock-bound semicircular bay, this picturesque port, rising in tier upon tier of white tenements and palaces from the Mediterranean to the Kasbah, provided a favorite lair for privateers. Even from Pompey's days, the corsairs of that coast had preyed upon defenseless shipping. After 1492, Algiers became a refuge for Moors fleeing from Spain. Many of them joined the pirate crews and turned with vengeful fury upon what Christian shipping they could waylay. Growing in number and audacity, the pirates manned fleets as strong as national navies and raided the North Mediterranean coasts. Spain retaliated with protective expeditions that captured Oran, Algiers, and Tripoli between 1509 and 1510. 
In 1516, a colorful buccaneer entered the picture. The Italians called him Barbarossa from his red beard. His actual name was Kyred and Kizer. He was a Greek of Lesbos who came with his brother Horush to join the pirate crew. While Kyredine raised himself to command of the fleet, Horush led an army against Algiers, expelled the Spanish garrison, made himself governor of the city, and died in battle in 1518. Kyredine, succeeding to his brother's power, ruled with energy and skill. To consolidate his position, he went to Constantinople and offered Selim I sovereignty over Tripoli, Tunisia, and Algeria in return for a Turkish force adequate to maintain his own authority as vassal governor of these regions. Selim agreed, and Suleiman confirmed the arrangement. In 1533, Khairuddin became the hero of Western Islam by ferrying 70,000 Moors from inhospitable Spain to Africa. Appointed first admiral of the entire Turkish fleet, Barbarossa, with 84 vessels at his command, raided town after town on the coasts of Sicily and Italy and took thousands of Christians to be sold as slaves. Landing near Naples, he almost succeeded in capturing Julia Gonzaga Colonna, reputed the loveliest woman in Italy. She escaped half-clad, rode off with one knight as her escort, and on reaching her destination, ordered his death for reasons which she left to be inferred. But Barbarossa aimed at less perishable booty than a beautiful woman. Landing his Janissaries at Bizert, he marched against Tunis in 1534. The Nefsid dynasty had ruled that city reasonably well since 1336. Arts and letters had flourished under their patronage. But Moulay Hassan, the current prince, had alienated the people by his cruelties. He fled as Barbarossa approached. Tunis was taken bloodlessly, Tunisia was added to the Ottoman realm, and Barbarossa was master of the Mediterranean. It was another crisis for Christendom, for the unchallenged Turkish fleet could at any moment secure a foothold for Islam in the Italian boot. Strangely enough, Francis I was at this time allied with the Turks, and Pope Clement VII was allied with France. Fortunately, Clement died on September 25, 1534. Pope Paul III pledged funds to Charles V for an attack on Barbarossa, and Andrea Doria offered the full cooperation of the Genoese fleet. In the spring of 1535, Charles assembled at Cagliari, in Sardinia, 400 vessels and 30,000 troops. Crossing the Mediterranean, he laid siege to Lagoletta, a fort commanding the Gulf of Tunis. After a month's fighting, Lagoletta fell, and the imperial army marched on to Tunis. Barbarossa tried to stop the advance. He was defeated and fled. Christian slaves in Tunis broke their chains and opened the gates, and Charles entered the city unresisted. For two days he surrendered it to pillage by his soldiers, who would otherwise have mutinied. Thousands of Moslems were massacred. The art of centuries was shattered in a day or two. The Christian slaves were joyously freed, and the surviving Mohammedan population was enslaved. Charles reinstated Moulay Hassan as his tributary vassal, left garrisons in Bona and Lagoletta, and returned to Europe. Barbarossa escaped to Constantinople, and there, with Suleiman's funds, built a new fleet of two hundred ships. In July 1537, this force effected a landing at Toronto, and Christendom was again besieged. A new Holy League of Venice, the Papacy and the Empire, took form, and gathered two hundred vessels off Corfu. On September 27th, the rival armadas at the entrance to the Ambracian Gulf fought an engagement almost in the same waters where Antony and Cleopatra had met Octavian at Actium. Barbarossa won and again ruled the seas. Sailing east, he took one after another of the Venetian possessions in the Aegean and Greece and forced Venice to a separate peace. Charles tried to win Barbarossa to his service by gifts and an offer to make him vassal king of North Africa, but Khairuddin preferred Islamic bait. In October 1541, Charles and Doria led an expedition against Algiers. It was defeated on land by Barbarossa's army and at sea by a storm. Barbarossa returned the call by ravaging Calabria and landing, unhindered, at Ostia, the port of Rome. The great capital shivered in its shrines, but Paul III was at that time on good terms with Francis, and Barbarossa, allegedly out of courtesy to his ally, paid in cash for all that he took at Ostia and departed peacefully. He sailed up to Toulon, where his fleet was welcomed by the matter-of-fact French. He asked that the church bells should suspend their ringing while Allah's vessels were in the harbor, for the bells disturbed his sleep, and his request was law. He joined a French fleet in taking Nice and Villefranche from the emperor. Then, 
Seventy-seven, the triumphant Corsair retired with full honors to die in bed at eighty in 1546. Bona, La Goleta, and Tripoli fell back to Islam, and the Ottoman Empire reached from Algiers to Baghdad. Only one Moslem power dared to challenge its predominance in Islam. 2. Safavid Persia, 1502-1576 Persia, which had enjoyed so many periods of cultural fertility, was now entering another epoch of political vitality and artistic creation. When Shah Ismail I founded the Safavid dynasty between 1502 and 1736, Persia was a chaos of kinglets. Iraq, Yazd, Semnan, Firuzku, Diyarbakir, Kashan, Khorasan, Kandahar, Balkh, Kirman, and Azerbaijan were independent states. In a succession of ruthless campaigns, Ismail of Azerbaijan conquered most of these principalities, captured Herat and Baghdad, and made Tabriz again the capital of a powerful kingdom. The people welcomed this native dynasty, gloried in the unity and power it gave their country, and expressed their spirit in a new outburst of Persian art. Ismail's rise to royalty is an incredible tale. He was three years old when his father died in 1490, thirteen when he set out to win himself a throne, still thirteen when he had himself crowned Shah of Persia. Contemporaries described him as brave like a young gamecock and lively as a fawn, stout, broad-shouldered, with furious mustaches and flaming red hair. He wielded a mighty sword with his left hand, and with the bow he was another Odysseus, shooting down seven apples in a row of ten. We are told that he was amiable as a girl, but he killed his own mother, or stepmother, ordered the execution of three hundred courtesans at Tabriz, and massacred thousands of enemies. He was so popular that the name of God is forgotten in Persia, said an Italian traveler, and only that of Ismail is remembered. Religion and audacity were the secrets of his success. Religion in Persia was Shia, that is, the party of Ali, son-in-law of Muhammad. The Shia recognized no rightful caliphs but Ali and his twelve lineal descendants, imams or holy kings. Since religion and government were not distinct in Islam, each such descendant had in this doctrine a divine right to rule both church and state. As Christians believed that Christ would return to establish his kingdom on earth, so the Shiites believed that the twelfth imam, Muhammad ibn Hassan, had never died but would some day reappear and set up his blessed rule over the earth. And as Protestants condemned Catholics for accepting tradition, along with the Bible as a guide to right belief, so the Shiites denounced the Sunnites, the Orthodox Mohammedan majority, who found the Sunnah, or path of righteousness, not only in the Quran but also in the practice of Muhammad as handed down in the traditions of his companions and followers. And as Protestants gave up praying to the saints and closed the monasteries, so the Shiites discountenanced the Sufi mystics and closed the cloisters of the dervishes, which, like the monasteries of Europe in their prime, had been centers of hospitality and charity. As Protestants called their faith the true religion, so the Shiites took the name Al-Maminum, true believers. No faithful Shiite would eat with a Sunnite. And if a Christian's shadow passed over a Shiite's meal, the food was to be discarded as unclean. Ismail claimed descent from the seventh Imam, Safi al-Din, purity of the faith, from whom the new dynasty was named. By proclaiming Shia as the national and official religion of Iran, and as the sacred standard under which he fought, Ismail united his people in pious devotion against the Sunnite Muslims who hemmed Persia in, the Uzbeks and Afghans on the east, the Arabs, Turks, and Egyptians on the west. His strategy succeeded. Despite his cruelties, he was worshipped as a saint, and his subjects so trusted in his divine power to protect them that some refused to wear armor in battle. Having won this fervent support, Ismail felt strong enough to challenge his neighbors, the Uzbeks who ruled Transoxiana had spread their power into Khorasan. Ismail took Herat from them and drove them out of Persia. Secure in the east, he turned west against the Ottomans. Each faith now persecuted the other with holy intensity. Sultan Selim, we are unreliably told, had 40,000 Shiites in his dominions killed or imprisoned before going forth to war in 1514. And Shah Ismail hanged some of the Sunnites who formed a majority in Tabriz, 
and compelled the rest to utter daily a prayer, cursing the first three caliphs as usurpers of Ali's rights. Nevertheless, in battle at Calderon, the Persians found Shia helpless before the artillery and janissaries of Selim the Grim. The Sultan took Tabriz and subdued all northern Mesopotamia in 1516. But his army mutinied, he retreated, and Ismail returned to his capital with all the glory that shrouds a martial king. Letters declined during his hectic reign, but art prospered under his patronage. He protected the painter Bizad and rated him as worth half of Persia. After twenty-four years of rule, Ismail died at thirty-eight, leaving the throne to his ten-year-old son in 1524. Shah the I was a faithless coward, a melancholy Sybarite, an incompetent king, a harsh judge, a patron and practitioner of art, a pious Shiite, and the idol of his people. Perhaps he had some secret virtues which he hid from history. The continuing emphasis on religion disturbed as well as strengthened the government, for it sanctioned a dozen wars and kept the Islam of the Near and Middle East divided from 1508 to 1638. Christendom benefited, for Suleiman interrupted his assaults upon the West by campaigns against Persia. Only the Persian stands between us and ruin, wrote Ferdinand's ambassador in Constantinople. In 1533, the Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha led a Turkish army into Azerbaijan, took fortress after fortress by bribing Persian generals, and finally captured Tabriz and Baghdad without striking a blow. Fourteen years later, during an armistice with Ferdinand, Suleiman led another army against the rascally Redheads, the Turkish name for the Persians, took thirty-one towns, and then resumed his attacks upon Christendom. Between 1525 and 1545, Charles repeatedly negotiated with Persia, presumably to coordinate Christian and Persian resistance to Suleiman. The West rejoiced when Persia assumed the offensive and captured Erzurum. But in 1554 Suleiman returned, devastated great stretches of Persia, and forced Tamasp to a peace in which Baghdad and Lower Mesopotamia fell permanently under Turkish rule. More interesting than these dismal conflicts were the venturesome journeys that Anthony Jenkinson made into Transoxiana and Persia in search of an overland trade route to India and Cathay. In this matter, Ivan the Terrible proved amiable. He welcomed Jenkinson in Moscow, sent him as his ambassador to Uzbek rulers at Bukhara, and agreed to let English goods enter Russia duty-free and pass down the Volga and across the Caspian. After surviving a violent storm on that sea, Jenkinson continued into Persia and reached Kasvin in 1561. There he delivered to Tamasp letters of salutation from a distant queen who seemed to the Persians a minor ruler over a barbarous people. They were inclined to sign a trade agreement, but when Jenkinson confessed himself a Christian, they bade him depart. We have no need of friendship with infidels, they told him. And as he left the Shah, a servant spread purifying sand to cover the Christian footprints that had polluted the Shia court. The death of Tamasp in 1576 concluded the longest but one of all Mohammedan reigns, and one of the most disastrous. It was not distinguished by any literature lovingly cherished in Persian memory, unless we include the fascinating memoirs of the expatriated Babur. But Safavid art, though its zenith would come later, already in these two reigns began to pour forth works of that grandeur, brilliance, and refinement which for twenty-two centuries have marked the products of Persia. In Isfahan, the mausoleum of Haruni Velaya displayed all the finesse of classic Persian design and the best color and cutting of mosaic faience. And a complex half-dome crowned the portal of the great Friday mosque. Another Masjidi Jami rose in this age at Shiraz, but time has swallowed it. In many instances, the delicate work of the illuminators and calligraphers has outlasted the architectural monuments and has justified the care that made the book in Islam almost an idol of loving reverence. The Arabs, proud of everything, were forgivably enamored of their alphabet, which lent itself to lines of sinuous grace. The Persians above all made that script an art in adorning the mirabs and portals of their mosques, the metal of their weapons, the clay of their pottery, the texture of their rugs, and in transmitting their scriptures and their poets in manuscripts that many generations would cherish as delights to eye and soul. The Nastalik, or sloping script, which had flourished under the Timurids at Tabriz, Herat, and Samarkand, returned to Tabriz under the Safavids, 
and went with them to Isfahan. As the mosque brought together a dozen arts, so the book employed poet, calligrapher, miniaturist, and binder into a collaboration quite as dedicated and devout. The art of illumination continued to flourish at Bukhara, Herat, Shiraz, and Tabriz. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts has a lordly man manuscript of Firdausi's Shahnama, signed by Araji Muhammad al-Kawam of Shiraz, from 1552. The Cleveland Museum has another illuminated by Mushid al-Kiatib, from 1538. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has one of the finest examples of Tabriz illumination and calligraphy in the title page from a copy, from 1525, of Nizami's Kamsu. The center of Mohammedan illumination moved to Tabriz when Bizad chose it for his residence, circa 1510. During the campaign of Khaldiran, Shah Ismail hid Bizad and the calligrapher Mahmud Nishapuri in a cave as his most precious possessions. Bizad's pupil, Akamirak, painted at Tabriz one of the master miniatures of this period, the Kosru and Shirin enthroned from 1539, now in the British Museum. Mirak in turn taught the art to Sultan, or Prince, Muhammad Nur. Born of a rich family, Muhammad ignored the fact that he had the means to be worthless. He became the pearl without price at the court of Shah Tamasp, for he surpassed all his contemporaries in calligraphy and illumination and in designing book covers and rugs. Between 1539 and 1543 he copied and illustrated the Kamsu of Nizami. A magnificent page in the British Museum shows King Kosru, mounted on a pink horse, peering through foliage of green, brown, and gold, at Shirin, bathing, half-naked, in a silver pool. Even more brilliant in color is a painting of the prophet riding through the skies on his winged horse Burak to visit heaven and hell. The features are grace incarnate, but deliberately and religiously without individualized features. The artist was interested in decoration rather than representation, and valued beauty, which, subjective, is sometimes attainable, more than truth, which objective always escapes. In these miniatures, Persian illumination reached the apex of its elegance. The same loving care and delicate designs went into textiles and rugs. No textiles survive from these reigns, but the miniatures picture them. In rugs, the Safavi designers and artisans were supreme. The carpet seemed an essential of civilization in Islam. The Moslems sat and ate not on chairs, but on a floor or ground covered with a rug. A special prayer rug, usually bearing religious symbols and a Quranic text, received his prostrations in his devotions. Rugs were favored as gifts to friends or kings or mosques. So Shah Tamasp sent twenty large and many small carpets of silk and gold to Selim II on the latter's accession as Ottoman Sultan in 1566. Some dominating feature of design classified the rugs as of the garden, floral, hunting, vase, diaper, or medallion type. But around these basic forms were meandering arabesques, Chinese cloud configurations, symbols conveying secret meanings to the initiate, animals lending the pattern life, plants and flowers giving it a kind of linear fragrance and joyful tone. And through the complex whole an artistic logic ran, a contrapuntal harmony of lines more intricate than Palestrina's madrigals, more graceful than Godiva's hair. Some famous Persian rugs survive from this first half of the 16th century. One is a medallion rug with 30 million knots in wool on a silk warp, 380 to the square inch. It lay for centuries in a mosque at Ardabil and is now divided between the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and the County Museum in Los Angeles. In a cartouche at one end is a verse from Hafiz, and beneath this the proud words, The Work of the Slave, Maksud of Kashan in the year 946, after the Hegira, that is, 1539. Also in the Los Angeles Museum is the immense coronation carpet used at the crowning of Edward VII in 1901. The Poldi Pizzoli Museum at Milan, before the Second World War shattered the building, counted among its greatest treasures a hunting rug by Giata Dinjami of Yazd, the Bizad of rug design. The Duke of Annalt rug, in the Duveen collection, won international renown for its gold-yellow ground and seductive arabesques in crimson, rose, and turquoise blue. The rug and the book are among the unchallengeable titles of Safavid Persia to a high place in the remembrance of mankind. 3. 
Suleiman and the West. Suleiman succeeded his father Selim I in 1520 at the age of 26. He had won a name for himself by his courage in war, his generosity in friendship, and his efficient administration of Turkish provinces. His refined features and gracious manners made him welcome in a Constantinople tired of Selim the Grim. An Italian who saw Suleiman soon after his accession described him as tall, wiry, and strong, the neck too long, the nose too curved, beard and mustache thin, complexion sallow and delicate, countenance grave and calm. He looked more like a student than a sultan. Eight years later another Italian reported him as deadly pale, melancholy, much addicted to women, liberal, proud, hasty, and yet sometimes very gentle. Ghislain de Busbeck, ambassador of the Habsburgs at the port, wrote almost fondly of the Habsburgs' most persistent enemy. He has always had the character of being a careful and temperate man. Even in his early days, when, according to the Turkish rule, sin would have been venial, his life was blameless, for not even in youth did he indulge in wine or commit those unnatural crimes which are common among the Turks. Nor could those who were disposed to put the most unfavorable construction on his acts bring anything worse against him than his excessive devotion to his wife. It is a well-known fact that from the time he made her his lawful wife he has been perfectly faithful to her, although there was nothing in the laws to prevent his having mistresses as well. It is a picture worth noting, but too flattering. Suleiman was doubtless the greatest and noblest of the Ottoman sultans, and equaled any ruler of his time in ability, wisdom, and character. But we shall find him now and then guilty of cruelty, jealousy, and revenge. Let us, however, as an experiment in perspective, try to view dispassionately his conflict with Christendom. The military debate between Christianity and Islam was already nine hundred years old. It began when Moslem Arabs snatched Syria from the Byzantine Empire in 634. It proceeded through the year-by-year -year conquest of that empire by the Saracens and the conquest of Spain by the Moors. Christendom retaliated in the Crusades, in which both sides covered with religious phrases and ardor their economic aims and political crimes. Islam retaliated by taking Constantinople and the Balkans. Spain expelled the Moors. Pope after Pope called for fresh crusades against the Turks. Selim I vowed to build a mosque in Rome. Francis I proposed to the Western powers in 1516 that they should utterly destroy the Turkish state and divide its possessions among themselves as infidel spoils. This plan was frustrated by the division of Germany in religious war, the revolt of the Spanish communes against Charles V, and the second thought of Francis himself, to seek Suleiman's aid against Charles. Suleiman may have been saved by Luther, as Lutheranism owed so much to Suleiman. Every government strives to extend its borders, partly to enlarge its resources and revenues, partly to create additional protective terrain between its frontiers and its capital. Suleiman supposed that the best defense was offense. In 1521 he captured the Hungarian strongholds of Zabatz and Belgrade. Then, feeling safe in the west, he turned his forces against Rhodes. There the Christians, under the Knights of St. John, held a heavily fortified citadel directly athwart the routes from Constantinople to Alexandria and Syria. It seemed to Suleiman a dangerous alien bastion in an otherwise Turkish sea. And in fact the pirate ships of the Knights preyed upon Moslem commerce in one end of the Mediterranean, as the Moslem pirates of Algeria preyed upon Christian commerce in the other. When Moslems were taken in these nightly raids they were usually slain. Vessels carrying pilgrims to Mecca were intercepted on suspicion of hostile purposes. Under all the circumstances, says a Christian historian, Suleiman was in no need of justification for an assault on Rhodes. And a distinguished English historian adds, it was in the interest of public order that the island should be annexed to the Turkish realm. Suleiman attacked with three hundred ships and two hundred thousand men. The defenders, led by the aged Grand Master Philippe de Villiers de Lille Adam, fought the besiegers for 145 days, and finally surrendered under honorable terms. The knights and their soldiery were to leave the island in safety, but within ten days. The remaining population were to have full religious freedom, and were to be exempt from tribute for five years. On Christmas Day, Suleiman asked to see the Grand Master. He condoled with him, praised his brave defense, and gave him valuable presents. And to the vizier Ibrahim, the sultan remarked that it caused him great sorrow to be obliged to force this Christian in his old age to abandon his home and his belongings. On January 1st, 1523, the knights sailed off to Crete, whence, eight years later, they passed to a more permanent home in Malta. 
The Sultan tarnished his victory by putting to death the son and grandchildren of Prince Jem because they had become Christians and might be used, as Jem had been, as claimants to the Ottoman throne. Early in 1525, Suleiman received a letter from Francis I, then a captive of Charles V, asking him to attack Hungary and come to the rescue of the French king. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1.